Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about specifically what cognitive behavioral therapy looks like. Uh, the goal is really focused on kind of negative beliefs and thoughts and, and behaviors. So as we talked about, like the negative cognitive triad, according to Beck, and, uh, and recognizing that those, those patterns of thought, those patterns of belief actually really do have a significant impact on your overall mental state. And so what, what it, it basically involves is the therapist trying to kind of get the client to, to question these kind of negative beliefs, these negative patterns of thought, and sort of figure out different ways of, of framing and understanding the situation that don't lead to these kinds of negative interpretations. And so essentially trying to break that vicious cycle of negative thought and negative affect and sort of break out of that and say, well, wait a second, maybe things aren't quite so bad. So there's many different ways in which we, we kind of sustain these negative patterns of thought. So overgeneralization is one of the major ones. So you have one negative effect, you have one negative outcome, uh, one bad grade on a test, and then you say, I'm a failure, I can't do anything. And so you're overgeneralizing from this one negative experience to say, you know, everything is horrible. And then in this context, you will often sort of say, well, you know, it doesn't matter that I did well on the previous test. I just, I just have lost it, you know? And so discounting positive uh, examples and really focusing on negative examples, this kind of selective filtering of experience through this kind of negative lens, uh, catastrophizing, sort of basically saying, oh, the world's going to end. This, it's a catastrophe. Over emphasizing these kind of negative uh, aspects of the interpretation of the situation. A therapist can come in and sort of say, well, wait a second, you know, really? That one test, that's it? You know, all the other stuff you've done well, that doesn't count for anything? And sort of pe having people recognize that, you know, oh, well, maybe that is just one thing and maybe I can move beyond that. And maybe I do have a good background and, back, uh, and history to build on and foundation to build on. Okay, so there's two aspects of behaviorism that are applied in the clinical setting. One is just kind of this basic idea about using behaviorist techniques for motivation, uh, reward, reinforcing good behavior, uh, maybe penalizing bad behavior a little bit, but more the emphasis is on the positive. Uh, so kind of reinforcing those positive aspects of behavior. So creating kind of rewards or, or positive uh, reinforcements for when people exhibit good patterns of behavior and good patterns of thought. Then the other is really specific more to anxiety uh, kinds of phenomena and associated with uh, sort of the extinction process, trying to get rid of negative associations. There are these two kind of remarkably opposite uh, strategies here that both seem to work, which is kind of puzzling. Uh, so the more intuitive one is systematic desensitization, where people basically get kind of very gently and progressively exposed to something that they're afraid of. So if you have somebody who's afraid of flying, you know, first you're just sitting in the, in the uh, therapist's office and you start talking about it, uh, kind of, you know, gently kind of thinking about just a little bit uh, towards, you know, maybe you should uh, imagine that you might take a trip, you know, and then you kind of build up and you say, well, let's take a trip to the airport. And, and the key thing at all these times is always ensuring that people feel safe and, and that you're getting that kind of extinction. So you're not getting this kind of fear response getting activated. And so you're essentially trying to associate, uh, to extinguish that association between uh, something that you fear like an environment uh, of the airplane. So ultimately then you end up kind of sitting in an airplane. Often it's done in the context of a, a flight simulator that's very realistic. So you can kind of get a feeling of kind of being in this situation, but knowing that it's very, very safe. But then there's this very strange kind of flooding behavior, which is essentially like if you're afraid of spiders, just cover yourself in spiders and sit there, you know, just completely overwhelmed with this kind of negative uh, stimulus that you, you fear most. And the idea there is essentially, you know, at some point your kind of uh, fear response is gonna extinguish uh, on its own, it's gonna, it's just gonna kind of wear out, and and that actually leads to an extinction-like learning. And as we reviewed in the context of uh, the uh, studies on depression and CBT and mind, mindful-based, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, 
the overwhelming uh, results across many of these different conditions is that for most people, therapy works really well. It's really the preferred uh, uh, form of treatment. The average person who goes to see a therapist is, is uh, better than 80% of people who don't go see uh, a therapist. So that's one indication of, of the kind of overall level of efficacy. And it is still the case that uh, even though therapy is effective and it causes significant uh, improvements, there still is room for improvement. So there's still some leftover level of uh, disorder even after therapy and treatment, some percent chance of uh, recidivism. Uh, and so there's still room to improve, even though uh, these therapeutic effects are, are uh, you know, still quite effective. Okay, and one of the perhaps surprising results from a lot of these randomized controlled studies is that typically any given therapy does something, okay? I think CBT, again, has the most well-established, reliable form of efficacy across these studies, but still there's benefits from just about any kind of therapy. And uh, some uh, way of describing this is kind of this dodo bird outcome uh, from Alice in Wonderland where they have a race and then the dodo bird kind of announces at the end, everybody's a winner, right? Uh, and so, uh, and, and the reason that people think this is true is essentially that a lot of the work is done just by having a therapist, right? Even if that therapist is not using kind of the best techniques uh, and giving you the best kinds of uh, strategies for dealing with a disorder, just having somebody to talk to, somebody with that special therapeutic relationship builds hope, builds confidence, gives you an environment where you can rebuild your self-efficacy uh, all those things come out kind of more, more or less naturally out of just any kind of therapy. So the bottom line is that, you know, it therapies work. It, it does take serious work to overcome these kinds of negative affective systems. We have really strong uh, kind of uh, defensive mechanisms in our brain trying to help us avoid negative situations uh, and risky uh, environments and all these other kinds of things and and to try to uh, recognize that those kind of uh, fears and and negative thoughts can be overblown and not applicable is challenging because it's it's easier to be safe than sorry kind of thing in in terms of evolution and how our brains are wired and so it does take a lot of work and the therapist in particular is that kind of extra boost that you need sometimes to really get you out of that vicious cycle and kind of reboot you in the right direction. Uh, and this mindfulness approach really tells you that the first step is fundamentally recognition and acceptance and understanding. And that actually can be, you know, a really big part of it is just not uh, kind of perpetuating that vicious cycle and recognizing that everybody has these kinds of difficulties and challenges and that it's normal, it's okay to feel those kind of uh, negative affect and, and anxiety uh, and, and depression. Um, and then just not to, to try to not get that kind of meta level boosting and, and reinforcement of those things and just say, well, yeah, that's, that's, it's hard, you know, this is what our brains are wired to do. And uh, I can accept myself, I can understand that I'm still me I'm still uh, capable of control and capable of doing really good things, even if I have this kind of uh, kind of experience of anxiety and depression. In contrast, uh, pharmacotherapy, you know, taking drugs again is 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 everybody's kind of uh, magic pill kind of ideal solution. Just take a pill and get happy, uh, but uh, it, it's unfortunately just not that easy. Um, it's, it, it is kind of actually at the level of placebo for many people. Now, placebos actually are quite effective in this situation. And again, you can think about therapy as a kind of placebo as well. Uh, but these placebos uh, have a lot less side effects than uh, the actual drugs that people are taking. Uh, and there really is this kind of corporate uh, kind of influence and marketing on uh, all of these antidepressant medications, marketing it as a miracle, miracle cure. And so you really ha do have to be wary of the fact that, you know, those people may not have your best uh, kind of mental health and interest. 
uh, in, in, in the top of their minds and they are kind of just trying to make money on you.